Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Alameda County Master Gardeners presentation on vegetables in containers. We have two speakers this morning, and I would like to introduce them. Uh, the first speaker is Pam Johnson, and she likes to describe herself as a passionate lifelong learner in the world of gardening. She began pursuing training in this area by obtaining an AA degree in horticulture slash floral design many years ago and continued with further training via the UC Master Gardeners program in 2016. Spending time in her garden every day is a priority, even if it's just a check in with every plant and tree to ask who grew today. The smells sounds and sights there are a joy every day for Pam. And our second speaker is Denise Burgess. <laughs> Denise is a retired uh, elementary school teacher and she became an Alameda County Master Gardener in 2014. She has always loved plants and wanted to learn more about gardening so she could share her knowledge with others. As a master gardener, she's organized plant activities for children at Alameda County Fairs, assisted with master gardener training classes, helped out at plant sales, provided support to food core participants as they established vegetable gardens in low income schools, and now is working with the Speakers Bureau to create and give presentations to groups. She also enjoys working on her own garden, growing vegetables in her raised bed tending her container plants and enjoying the sunshine. Our mission is to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable gardening practices to residents of California and to be guided by our core values and strategic initiatives. Well, welcome. It's great to see so many people interested in container gardening. Whether you have a big space or a small one, containers are a wonderful way to enhance an outside garden as well as a patio, a deck, or a balcony. So um, to help you to have a beautiful, fruitful container garden, uh, these are the topics that we're gonna be um, covering today. So first of all, um, knowing your own environment of where you have to plant and what containers you wanna use. Um, we're also gonna be covering the proper kind of soil that you should use in your container. And of course, selecting the plants um, for the container and for your garden. Um, and especially in this time of drought, um, how to use good watering techniques, um, how to fertilize your plants and care for them. And hopefully you won't have any pests, but if you do, how to take care of them too. So the primary first question is why gardening containers? Well, there's many reasons that are really, really attractive for us gardeners. You can plant almost anything anywhere. There's a lot of flexibility here. Um, some folks might have a small balcony area or a patio area in which they have available to plant um, containers. So it differs with every homeowner. You can also move your plants around. Uh, homegrown vegetables and fruits certainly taste better than those that we buy in a grocery store. And you can choose what you decide to plant. And most of all, uh, this whole process is really versatile, creative, and fun. And you're going to see why as we move on. So once you've decided to have a container garden, um, there are some uh, things you need to, some decisions you need to make. Um, you may have seen some beautiful pictures in magazines of gorgeous gardens with containers and um, want to make your garden look just like that. But of course, you have to consider your own space and your own environment. Um, also, you need to consider the kind of containers that you're going to be using. You need to gonna, you're going to need to decide what size, uh, what you want to plant, uh, how they look in your garden, and also the soil, the kind of soil that you're going to be using, um, whether you're going to be using a drip system or watering uh, by hand and what kind of fertilizer you want to use. 
And there are a couple of other um, considerations as well. One is cost. And um, if you've gone to um, a nursery department lately, you know that um, it can add up pretty quickly buying plants and soil and all kinds of things for your plants. So, you know, you want to think before you start of how much you want to spend, what your budget is, and also how much time you have to dedicate to your plants. Um, you know, you not only have to have the time to plant them, but they're going to need maintenance um, to produce a bountiful crop for your garden. Excellent. So first of all, let's talk about the environment. Where are you intending to put your containers to grow successfully? Um, the first question is full sun or part shade? So some plants require a little bit more sun than others and full sun is considered six to eight full hours a day of direct sunlight. Partial sun would be at least four hours of sunlight a day. Um, some herbs in fact might prefer filtered sunlight, but overall really key to remember, no vegetable or fruit is gonna do well in a full shaded area, just does not work. One thing, um, that you can consider for herbs is even small containers on a windowsill in your kitchen kind of thing, as long as there is sufficient sunlight um, provided, they can be really successful in that environment. Also really key is to consider when I put my containers in position of where I want them to be, um, what kind of temperature and wind am I subjecting them to? So for instance, afternoon sun and heat can be really hard on some plants. It can dry out those leaves and the soil itself really, really quickly, as can wind, which can dry out fruits and flowers. If, for instance, you have your containers in a balcony area and it's extremely windy, you might even think about how do I block that wind? Maybe I could get a small little bamboo screen, put it against the rail, and that blocks the incoming wind. Just sort of thinking ahead of how you can optimize the growing conditions for your containerized plants. So next we need to think about containers. And one thing about containers is there are so many choices. <clears throat> choices of material, of size, <clears throat> excuse me, of the shape of the um, container. A container should complement the plant, not be too big or too small, and something that'll look attractive in your garden. Now there's basically two kinds of pots. There's porous and non-porous. Most of the porous pots are um, unglazed terracotta. And some like that because it, the plant actually breathes better in a terracotta pot but it uses more water and that's something that you have to consider. Um, you see the picture there of the, of the bucket. Now that's an example of a non-porous pot, which would use less water, but you also have to think, think about, does it have enough drainage? Here are some more um, container options. Wine barrels, a lot of people like to use the big wine barrels and they're great for large container um, planting. Um, you can use tubs, metal, even cement, although some of them are kind of heavy. Um, if you have something like um, strawberries or tomatoes, you might want to get um, a hanging basket, which you could line with moss to make it um, kind of a softer appearance. Um, if you have a window box near your kitchen, you're very fortunate because then you could put in um, like uh, lettuce that has um, shallow roots, you can put in, you know, herbs, uh, radishes, and then when you want to eat, um, you just can <laughs> go right outside your kitchen and um, get your salad. <laughs> um, and also some people like um, fabric bags, wall pouches, um, all kinds of things. Um, 
I had um, the opportunity to be in Bolivia um, several years ago with a nonprofit. And there are a lot of people there that are moving from the countryside into the city. And when they get to the city, they want to plant the, um, th their food like they did when they lived in the country. And um, you know, they didn't have money to buy containers. So they went out and collected old tires that were often along the side of the road. And they would put um, plants, they would put their seeds into the, um, into the tires and they would put them on, like made a terrace out of these old tires. And it was just amazing. It was just the, the um, tires were just full of all this wonderful looking um, produce. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. You can you know, use what you have on, on hand. Um, now there are though some things that you need to consider. Um, you know, like I said, the, you know, the right size for the plants. So if you buy little nursery um, startup plants, the, you should put, it, put them in a pot that's one to two inches bigger than the pot that you get from the nursery. Um, you also wanna think about whether you can move it. Is it the right size for you? Um, and if, you, if it's a big pot and you want to plant in that pot, you can also think about ways to move it, like maybe with a shovel, uh, with a, a shovel that has like a flat blade, um, a hand truck, if you have a hand truck, or they have some nice plant stands with, um, with wheels. Um, you want to be sure that your pot is sturdy enough that it's not going to fall apart during the growing season, which can be very disconcerting. And also if it has drainage. Now, um, you can turn many pots upside down and drill your own holes. Um, if you can't do that, you can put a layer of sand underneath the pot and um, that will absorb some of the water. Um, and, and don't put your plant, your container on the flat concrete because then the water is gonna have a problem you know, leaving the pot. It's almost like not having a, a drainage hole. Um, so you could use a saucer. On this picture, you see a saucer. It looks like it's a very shallow one, which is good because you don't want, um, you don't want to accumulate water into the, into the saucer. Um, that not only is not good for the plants, but it also will attract um, mosquitoes. Excellent. So now that you're considering your containers and the size of those containers to accommodate the plants that you intend to grow, let's consider the next step, the soil that you're going to put inside those containers. So basically, we're talking about potting soil, which is a very different animal than garden soil. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But potting soil goes specifically within containers. You can buy it in prepackaged forms in different sizes, one cubic foot, two cubic feet um, bags. It also depends on uh, ergonomically, is it comfortable for you to lift a two cubic bag? Um, it isn't for me backwise. And so I tend to get the smaller one cubic foot bags and then it's really pretty easy to move around. Um, you can also make your own potting soil with peat moss mixed with compost, a few handfuls of fertilizer mixed in and all of it together. Um, the advantage of mixing your own potting soil is that it is far less expensive um, than buying a bag of potting soil, which typically varies between six and $8 a bag. And you can make it for far, far less if you buy a bag of peat moss and then uh, compost and some fertilizer. Um, and move it into your containers that way. More tips about container soil. So if you're looking at potting soil called soilless media, um, the advantages are is that if you're buying it in a store, it's usually sterile and free of pests from the garden. It may not have insects, weeds, disease. It's lighter. Um, and it actually has sort of a consistency, like, like fluffy, crumbly, it's pretty light to move around. However, as noted before, it is more expensive. If you were, uh, on the other hand, to compare that to soil-based media, in other words, garden soil, um, 
that has, may have insects and weeds and seeds of all kinds or disease that have lived in that soil or have survived over the winter and now they're back. And that soil is heavier. It does retain nutrients longer than potting soil, but as we'll discuss as we move along, the job of a garden container gardener um, is to make sure that they are providing um, fertilizers and feeding their garden plants so that they do have enough nutrients. Okay, now comes the fun part, choosing your plants. Now, if you're the kind of gardener that likes to plant from seed, you may already have some little seedlings ready to go in. Um, at this point, by almost May, it's probably a little too late to um, start summer plants from seed, but there is no shortage in the nurseries and big box stores of seedlings, or sometimes they call them starts, um, that you can purchase. And of course, like uh, Pam said, you wanna be sure that you know whether the plants need sun or shade. Um, and if they're good for your microclimate. So if you live in Livermore, you probably are not gonna buy the same kind of plants as you would if you live in um, Alameda. Um, now you wanna also select plants that are proportioned to your, um, to your container. So like you wouldn't wanna put pumpkins in a window box, so to speak, um, for example. Um, if you're not sure just what the best plants are for your um, microclimate, you can get advice from people, knowledgeable people at a nursery. Um, unfortunately, the big box stores don't usually have as knowledgeable people. Sometimes you might luck into someone, but um, at a nursery, they usually have someone on duty that can help you with those decisions. Um, so uh, things for a small pot might be cherry tomatoes, herbs, strawberries, because they have shallow roots. On the other hand, if you want to have cabbage or potatoes, you are going to need a minimum depth and diameter of 12 inches. Um, you need as much as a 15 to 20 gallon container if you want baby watermelon. And don't even think of the big watermelon. <laughs> Those probably would not be good in a pot at all. Um, and you wanna be sure that in your pot, you're gonna have room for the roots and to do what we call top dress the container, which is putting in several inches of, um, of compost. Um, so planting now for pollinators, um, what does that mean? Um, well, first of all, you can put more than one kind of plant in a container if they have si um, similar needs and similar size. Um, also, you could put different herbs in a pot or herbs with some of your other vegetables. And if you fill the pot, you're not gonna have as much space for weeds to grow, which is of course um, uh, added um, plus. You also may want to pair some of your orna ornamental flowers with, um, with the vegetables um, because ornamental flowers attract pollinators and the pollinators will not only come to the ornamental flowers, but will also come to, um, will also uh, come to the flowers when your um, vegetables are flowering. Um, some good ones, um, for example, are marigolds, calendulas, um, nasturtiums, Cosmos does well. Um, don't plant flower bulbs with veggies. And as some of these can be poisonous. And I did have a bad experience with this once. Um, I picked what I thought was a nice onion for my 80 some year old mother. And it turned out it was a flower bulb. Oh. Luckily she only took one bite. <laughs> Gosh, okay. Oh, oops, sorry, I went too far. There. No problem. So uh, our next really important consideration is what kind of water needs do our plants and containers have? Um, and it's really critical to note that frequent watering is essential. Um, and there are a few ways that you can do that. You can water by hand with a watering can if you're talking about perhaps a small area like on a balcony or on a patio area. Um, or you can use your hose if it's in close enough proximity to your containers and put it on a gentle spray. Um, you 
in most cases want to get down as close to the roots as you can rather than go on the top of the leaves necessarily. And I think it's really important to make the point to your watering in the morning, especially in the summertime, because if you water later, late afternoon, the water may not have sufficient time to evaporate away and dry on those leaves, which means your leaves are going overnight maybe getting that <clears throat> moisture. And there is a tendency then to develop mildew on some of those plants, especially zucchini. That's a big problem if you water too late and you hit those leaves with water and they don't dry out. Um, you can be looking at mildew for sure. Um, another form of irrigation that's really effective is drip irrigation. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, basically what you want to do is check your moisture level in your container. And I would check that every day. And, and there's basically a very uh, low tech way of doing that. And that's by using your index finger and sticking it into the soil about an inch. And if it feels very, very moist in that soil, uh, it is telling you, you don't need to water again right now. Wait till it dries out a little bit before you add more water. Okay, looking at drip irrigation in containers, there's several reasons why a lot of gardeners love it. It saves time. They don't have to go out every day, <coughs> excuse me, and do some watering, whether by hose or um, a watering can. The water goes exactly where it's needed to the root of the plant because you put the little hose in the emitter where the water drips out right next to the plant. Um, you can buy kits readily available in garden and hardware stores. They're not very expensive and they come with the parts that you need to do the whole job. It's really convenient. And for instance, picture if you wanna go away for a few days, um, and you're worried about, oh my goodness, how do I water my plants while I'm away? Drip system eliminates that concern because it's happening automatically with or without you there. Um, it's also important to note that you can get a little timer in that drip system so that your drip system would come on at a specific time every day for the number of minutes that you set it up for, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, done, and it's off. Uh, the beauty of a drip system is that it is delivering water uniformly to your plants so that the plant is not struggling um, to get enough water to thrive and grow and then produce uh, vegetables and fruits. One of the main problems for plants in containers, it is if they don't get sufficient water consistently, they're weakened. And they're then in a position where they're really susceptible to disease. And also incoming pests can take their swipes at them too. So consistent watering is, is one of the uh, hugest ways to keep your plant healthy. The cons of a drip system might be that, well, you've got to put out a little additional money. I don't think it's much. Um, and I hesitant to say how much because I haven't bought one lately. And so um, they're, as I said, available in garden stores and hardware stores. All the supplies needed come in that little kit. And you have to know and take a few minutes. And really, I don't think it's more than that because I put them together um, to really see how those parts fit together. So the essentials of drip irrigation, if you're thinking of doing drip irrigation, go ahead and look at your containers and plan ahead to design. Well, I wanna have a hose here and I want to supply water to this plant over here. And after you've done that, then get your kit at the hardware store or nursery. Take a few minutes to look at the parts of the kit, read the directions and uh, see how those parts interconnect. And also have to tell you, there are some tremendous videos on YouTube that are about seven minutes long showing you exactly connect this here, do this now. Really a simple setup. And I've done it at a school garden in, um, in Arinda and have the same experience. It's not complicated. 
Okay, and just a little reminder here, um, if you have any questions, don't forget, you can put them in our chat box. Okay, so a few more water saving tips. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and it's so important because these container plants, they have special needs that other plants don't have. They have, the air is dry all the way around them. So they have this dry air that they're kind of encased in. Um, and the roots don't have a chance to go out and look for water like roots in a, um, you know, in your a regular part of your garden do. They can kind of just stretch out until they find little bits of moisture. Well, the potted plants, of course, can't, um, can't do that. Um, one thing you can do is to choose plants that don't take as many days to mature. So like if you're looking for um, a tomato plant and one says it matures in 40 days and another in 65 days, you know, pick the one that's for 40 days because then you'll have your produce in a shorter period of time and you won't need to water as long. Um, and then of course, when you're planting, making sure that you have the organic material in the pot and that you use mulch on the, on the top. Um, now, Pam already mentioned about watering in the morning. Another thing about watering is with your hose, if your hose has been sitting in the sun, it can be very, the water in that hose can be very hot. And so um, if you just start spraying your plants with this water from the hose and you don't check the temperature, you could possibly even um, burn your plants. Now, people always ask, how much water do you need? Now, Pam said, put your finger in. That's a wonderful way to do it. Another way is when you start watering, so you know it needs water, it's dry, you start watering, and the water should run freely from the hole for close to a minute. And if it does that, then you know that the, um, your plant has probably gotten enough water. Um, there's ways to make um, pots more water saving. Um, if you have a wine barrel, you can use some plastic when you, when you set it up, plastic around the edge, um, and that will keep the water from seeping out. Um, if you have a terracotta pot that you really love, but you don't like the way it loses so much water, you can actually put some, um, spread some asphalt around the edge and that will help with that. Um, and then of course, moving your pots. Um, if you don't have a drip system, um, you could put your plants, if you're gonna be away for a few days, just group them and put them in a shady spot in a tray and put water in the tray. And it may not be good for your plants to always be sitting in water, but for a short period of time, like a vacation, it can save your, um, can save your plants. Um, you also can set one, one pot inside of a larger pot. And then the, the space inside you fill with like um, damp peat and a few pebbles. Now, of course, we've got the problem now that we don't know if we're gonna have water rationing. And we do know we have drought conditions. So um, one thing that you can use, and a lot of people like, is a rain barrel. And the idea from a rain barrel is the rain comes down through the, um, through your storm, through your uh, gutters and um, down into your, um, uh, down the pipe into your rain barrel, and then you save it up and you can use it to water later. Now, of course, um, with the fact that we haven't gotten much water uh, rain at all this season, um, that only works for, you know, a short time, and then you run out of the rainwater. Um, but you can use other water as well. You can put uh, water from like the wash vegetables um, you know, all of that water would be good to put in your, round, your rain barrel and you could use, or water from um, uh, like in the shower, um, not after the shower, but before you take the shower while you're waiting for the water to get warm, you can also, um, also use that. Some people like these water retention gels, they're little water absorbing polymers, kind of like little sponges but they have not really been proven um, by research to be all that um, effective. Right now, there's still no um, definite restrictions, but um, you, know, you can keep looking on these websites and get some more ideas and also find out what the um, restrictions will, um, will be. 
So fantastic. We've talked about choosing containers, the potting soil appropriate for them, choosing your plants, irrigation necessary. And now let's talk about feeding your plants because imagine that they are uh, a little growing organism inside a confined area. And as Denise mentioned a moment ago, their roots cannot go out into a garden to seek nutrients. They have to be provided with nutrients consistently as they grow and mature so that they're able to produce. So proper fertilization is really critical. Using a slow release fertilizer or fertilizing frequent frequently with liquid fertilizer is a good idea. The faster a plant is growing, the more nutrients it needs. Um, so it's really important to know your plant well. So if you go to any garden store or hardware store, you're going to probably see shelves and shelves of various kinds of fertilizers. And they're broken down into two categories, basically chemical fertilizers and organic fertilizers. So chemical fertilizers uh, come in huge variety. Um, and some of them are very specific to certain kinds of plants. So you might go into a nursery and see that there are fertilizers for roses or fertilizers for succulents, um, et cetera. So, they are specific to the needs of those plants. Some plants uh, need more of one component than another. Um, and so that's how those types of fertilizers are set up. They are, chemical fertilizers are precise, they're quick acting and they're relatively low cost. Um, so you can buy them in a number of forms, whether it's granular form in a bag or liquid form in a container that you pour or mix with water. Um, those are all relatively low cost. They're also made of non-renewable fossil fuels, which is one thing that folks might feel is a drawback. Um, if you over fertilize greatly with them, um, you could in fact then um, have those over fertilizing gardens um, have some kind of a negative effect with soil, groundwater, that kind of thing. But in general, uh, farmers have produced their crops around the world using also chemical fertilizers very successfully. And that's what we also depend upon uh, for our food. So <laughs> pardon me, the other type of fertilizer are organic fertilizers and they come from natural materials. So they are renewable, they are biodegradable, they break down into the soil uh, without any negative effect. Um, their nutrient content is often lower and they're a slower release kind of a fertilizing agent. They're also a little higher in cost. Some examples of organic, <coughs> excuse me, fertilizer could include worm castings, uh, which is worm waste. One of the best fertilizers ever, very effective. Uh, bone meal, various types of animal manure, chicken, steer. Um, chicken tends to be very hot. So you would want to mix small amounts of it within the soil and typically give it a few days at least uh, to sort of break down and cool down. Um, in that potting soil. But basically, as we see here, plants do not care where their nutrients come from, whether they be chemical or organic, they're going to depend and appreciate getting those nutrients. Okay, well, we have covered a lot. Um, so just a few uh, container cultivation um, tips. Um, one is, of course, pruning and training when the plants um, need it. Um, now, you probably know that something like radishes, um, they need to be, um, and carrots, they need to be thinned. Otherwise, they won't produce a um, proper size uh, piece of uh, vegetable. <laughs> um, pruning 
um, can keep, keep it under control, make your garden look nicer, and also can be better, it can um, stimulate you know, growth on the, the plant itself. Um, some plants, uh, container plants, may need support. Um, a trellis, you can put a little, a small trellis in a pot, and that can be great for uh, cucumbers or, um, or beans. Um, if you have tomatoes, um, you know, they have, um, you can either make your own or you can buy a um, tomato cage um, and the tomatoes will go up the, um, up the page, up the, um, the cage. Um, and of course, um, you want to um, try to uh, keep pests out of your containers. Now that could be pests or a whole could be a whole nother workshop. So I'm just going to mention a few little tips that could help. Um, I think Pam already mentioned irrigating in the morning. Um, and besides some of the other benefits, irrigating in the morning keeps, if you irrigate later in the day, then the pests, a lot of pests come out at that time and the water is still there and they just are attracted to your, um, to your plants. Um, certain, um, certain plants will help prevent pests. Um, like if you plant mint in your, um, in your uh, pot, um, that would be good for aphids and beetles to keep them out. Um, for that, maybe you've had hornworm on your tomatoes. That's like the worst kind of uh, pest and it can just destroy your tomatoes. And, but if you have a little borage or basil near those tomato plants or even peppers, um, that will um, help with keep the horn, horn worms away. Um, the basil has a very strong smell and they don't like that smell. Um, chives and onions will help keep aphids and spider mites away. And something that I like is copper. I buy um, this in the nursery, they'll sell copper on a, on a roll. It's like, like a ribbon kind of. And then you put it around the container or I sometimes put it around my raised bed and slugs and snails can't go over there. Um, some of the, the chemicals they have in their body don't react well to the copper and so they won't come into your, um, into your container. Um, and then one last thing I wanna put in a plug for is a planting table. Um, I had always um, planted my pots, you know, on the ground and all. And, um, you know, as we get older, that's not quite as comfortable anymore. And um, I bought, last year, I bought a planting table. And it's just wonderful. And it has a little drawer for my, my gloves and my um, shovel. And, um, you know, I can plant now at eye level. And it's also an attractive addition to my garden. Um, it has, I have some, you know, other um, potted plants on top of the, um, on top of it when I'm not doing my actual planting. And so that might be something that you want to consider um, as well. So gosh, to recap what we've talked about and looked at, um, the environment in container gardening needs to really match the needs of the plants that you're choosing. The size and the type of the container matches how that plant is going to grow. If it is going to grow very tall, then as Janice just mentioned, you probably want a support system of some kind, whether it be a tomato cage or a trellis. Um, there are ways to support tall growing plants. And in fact, if you grow vertically, that gives you more room. So that is a real plus. If you're living in uh, an apartment, for instance, with a balcony where your containers are, growing vertically gives you a lot of opportunity to grow more in a smaller space. Using potting soil effectively is really important uh, to your plant growing in containers. And selecting plants based on what you and your family enjoys eating is clearly important. Watering your plants consistently, very, very critical. Uh, forgot to mention, Denise and I have uh, talked about this in other Hello. presentations, but sometimes if you're going I'm away you have a day or two, you could take an empty water bottle uh, with the cap on with water in it, but in the cap, you have put little holes with a needle um, that I just heated up 
on a candle, stuff little holes, turn it upside down, put it in the soil, and it's watering my plants on a drip system as I'm away for a few days, very effective. So water your plant consistently, fertilize your plants regularly and they will love you and they will grow. Um, and more than anything, then you get to have the fun of enjoying your harvest. These are some resources that UC Master Gardener Program of Alameda County offers. And these are various um, demonstration gardens, as you can see, Lake Merritt Trials Garden, Albany, um, Quarry Lakes, Livermore. So these gardens are at all of these different sites. And gosh, they have all kinds of uh, tremendous opportunities to learn there. There are also many speaking engagements like the one that you're attending today on a variety of subject matter. We also have the, um, <clears throat> pardon me, the Alameda County Master Gardener Help Desk, um, where if you have an issue with a plant, um, there's something going on in your garden you don't understand, you can contact the Help Desk at, <clears throat> at this website and actually uh, get your answers to your garden problem. So really, really interesting and uh, important. More, reset, uh, more resources for drought tips are noted here. And uh, there's so much out there to be had in the way of information. So if you have any questions um, that you would also like to have answered, please feel free to type them into the chat room now. It's been our tremendous pleasure to present to you and we're available now for questions. Great, so we have quite a few questions here. And so let me start reading them to you. Um, let's see. I noticed my potting soil in my container planters have become compacted. Should I be doing something for this? I am a novice gardener, thanks. Compacted, uh, that makes me wonder if this is potting soil from last year or um, if this is brand new potting soil. Uh, a lot of times folks still have their potting soil from last year's crop, et cetera. A good way to go would be to uh, refresh that soil to uh, maybe take at least a third or a half of it out of the container, put in fresh potting soil, some compost, a couple of handfuls of fertilizer, mix it all up well before you plant. I would refresh your soil. Okay. Yeah. Another thing too, like if you, you're starting with a, a pot that you don't, you don't really know, like maybe you've had a plant in there that hasn't done well or was even mm. diseased. You want to clean that container before you use it again. You want to like maybe with one tenth um, uh, chlorine bleach and uh, water and you can just kind of clean it, clean it out and kind of sanitize it before you put in um, new soil, but yeah, it's always hard to get rid of your, because you have to throw out a lot of times, a lot of soil from the previous year. Right, good thinking. Great, thank you. Um, the next, there are actually two questions, but they're related to each other. Could you please repeat how to identify that the plant does not need water and what is considered frequent watering? Wow, that's that's hard because <laughs> you know it totally depends on the kind of pot, the kind of exposure, where you live. Um, so there's no real um, you know definite answer. I mean, you know, putting your finger in or um, you know watering a little bit, see if it runs out. Um, you know, just and then looking at the leaves. Sometimes the leaves kind of tell you that um, I'm thirsty. You know. Mm -hmm. What else do you think, Pam? I don't know. <laughs> no, I would completely agree. For instance, I'm in Castro Valley and I know that Livermore, Dublin, or yes, Dublin and uh, Danville and also Pleasanton, they're a good 10 degrees hotter 
in the summer. It's much more intense heat than it is here. Uh, I basically go out every day and look at my plants and talk to them and stick my finger in and do the whole visual thing of the leaves and you know, commiserate that way. So that is based on a lot of visual and also the finger test. Um, and I sort of do it daily, but then again, I get a kick out of doing it daily. I sort of enjoy that part. And there are moisture meters that you can use, um, you know, where you stick the actual moisture meter in and it'll say dry, moist, wet, um, you know, that can help too sometimes with new gardeners. And can you get those in garden centers, Denise? Yeah, yeah. You I've seen them. Them. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Very good. Um, our next question is, I have a worm bin. Is it safe to use the liquid that drains off straight on my plants or should I cut it in half? Oh, can I jump in here? Yes. I, I'm a retired. <laughs> Denise and I taught together for many years at the same school. So um, I had a worm bin for my class and I was delighted uh, that I had a container under the worm bin to catch the worm tea, which is the worm urine. It is fantastic fertilizer as are the worm castings, the solid material they leave in the soil. So as part of, of working with our worm bin and growing vegetables, we took that worm tea and we fertilized our plants. Well, Mrs. Johnson, no, it did not have enough water mixed with that very strong worm tea. I did mix it with water. Maybe it was half and half, but I found the next day that was too much because many of our plants were burned by that worm tea. So it was a good lesson. It's very powerful. I would start off by doing a small amount of the worm tea mixed with a much greater amount of water. Okay, we have a follow-up statement from the person that had compacted soil. Um, it was actually brand new material they purchased, and um, but it the outside of the bag says garden soil. Oh. So what would you advise them to do? All right, Denise or? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, like we were saying, there is there are two kinds of soil and it's confusing. It confused me for many years. I, I didn't know the difference, but um, it, and you know, you can use them interchangeably, but if, if it's actually specifically says potting soil or container soil, it's for, it's for your container gardening and it does the best. It has all the nutrients you need. Um, the planting soil, it's assuming you're gonna be mixing it with your garden soil, which has some nutrients in it, hopefully. And so that is the kind that you wanna use for the, um, uh, for just your regular, um, you know, garden in, in soil kind of garden to, to uh, strengthen that and to add just a few more nutrients. So, yeah, so I don't, I mean, I, um, Susan, they said they bought the, what did they say again? They purchased garden. garden soil, bagged garden soil, not potting soil. Yeah, I mean, they could, maybe, maybe what they could do is buy some potting soil and then if they don't have any other place to use it, like they only have containers, maybe what they could do is kind of mix it the two together so they don't have to just like not you know, throw away. the other one right um i don't know or find right. another gardener to give it to yeah <laughs> yes yeah. right yeah Could definitely um, this next question is related to sort of related to the worm bin question um this person is asking me about fish emulsion and using that as fertilizer on potted plants uh, yes, I think it's very it's very excellent uh, fertilizer. It's also strong. So I think you need to really adhere to the directions on the container so that you don't burn plants. I think that is really important. But you know, think about it. Native Americans were using fish in holes to um, to grow their corn um, right about when we moved into the country uh, as settlers. So they taught us how yep. powerful fish emulsion can be. Okay. Um, this is another question related to the soil. Um, let's see. 
Well, I thought I had it. Hang on a second. <laughs> See if I can find it again. It had to do with how do you prepare the container for the new season when soil was used for the last season's produce? Denise, I think you mentioned that you want to take yeah, that one. Yeah, I, um, right. That I um, we said that you know if it's a huge pot, if it's a large pot, you can mix some of the old soil with the new. You know, make sure you get plenty. Maybe two thirds of the new soil should be new soil. If it's a small pot, I mean, really, you just have to kind of dump it and you know just go with the new soil is is more successful. And you also mentioned maybe sterilizing that pot just to make sure that you got rid of any bad guy insects that might have overwintered in that pot. Right. Okay. Very good. Um, this next question says, I am concerned about the hot sun beating down on my garden. And I was wondering about a light, fairly loose burlap covering. Are there certain vegetables that would prefer a little sun protection on occasion? I think herbs sometimes uh, like filtered sunlight, uh, but there are a lot of plants that are sort of sun lovers. Tomatoes love sun, um, zucchini. Um, so many of the garden vegetables um, that I've seen really prefer the sun. You know, one thing that can, I think, um, make uh, new gardeners a little nervous about zucchini is that a lot of times after the sun's been out for a little while, the zucchini just kind of mm. looks like it flops. And well, you think, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't water it enough um, this morning or what's wrong with it. And it just kind of does that. Um, and then, you know, come evening and the leaves will come out again <laughs> and look fine. And uh, so, you know, not to be overly worried if the zucchini leaves, if you know you've watered it enough and the zucchini leaves just kind of um, wilt in the sun because the plants are made to be in the sun. I mean, you think about our crops right. in farmland. I mean, they're all all, no, you know, no one puts burlap or anything, you know, over, over those in, you know, in the fields. Um, so. I have seen a little bit of sun scald sometimes on uh, sweet peppers. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be uh, something you'd want to watch if we have really high temperatures, which don't happen that often. Mm -hmm. And also another thing is if your plants are near a concrete wall, like okay. I have a really, one side of my house gets, uh, gets really great su Southern exposure. It's the best for Southern exposure. But if I plant the, the, um, the it's kind of a raised bed that's attached to the house. And if I plant right there, sometimes it will burn, the plants will burn just because of reflection from mm -hmm. the, the concrete wall. So, you know, that's something maybe to consider too. Okay, one of the next questions is, I'm growing mint in a terracotta container that has pretty thick walls. The mint will do well for a while and then we'll have a lot of yellow leaves that fall off easily. Any advice? I thought mint was supposed to grow like a weed. I would never plant it in the ground for that reason. Well, that's true. Mint is one of the most invasive plants ever. Um, it is a fabulous plant to have, but I think you have to containerize it. Otherwise it's gonna take over your whole space. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm hearing about uh, yellowing leaves, I'm wondering if there might be some overwatering going on. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, two to, um, you know, there is, it's really great putting more than one plant in a container, but you need to make sure that they are compatible, and that includes being compatible for water use as as well. So maybe they are getting too much water. I'm, I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. Um, is the mint by itself in the container or is it with other um, plants? Uh, they don't give that detail. It sounds like, oh, they just responded. It's by itself. Okay, is it, uh, what kind of sunlight is it getting? Let's see what they say, if they say anything. <laughs> Does it receive full sun or is it in the shade? 
She says, I just moved it to morning sun, afternoon shade. Yeah, mint doesn't need, mint doesn't need as much um, sun as some other plants, I know, but. I mean, because yeah. sometimes if people put it around another plant in a pot, the other, uh, the foliage from the central plant kind of shades it a bit. So I don't know if it's only, if that's the only plant in the, in the pot, I don't know, that might be a, an issue. Right. So um, maybe what you can do is try different locations um, of your pot. And, and the good news is that your pot is portable, so you can move it to different locations. But I've had some interesting experiences where I had a plant growing in one area and it hated it. Now it was down to one stick of a trunk. And I thought, well, you know, I may as I have nothing to lose. I'm going to move you. And so then I would move him to a completely different place and he thrived. So, you know, sometimes it's an experimenting experience. Okay. Um, the next question is how frequently should tomato, basil, kale, onion bulbs, green onion plants be fertilized regularly? Well, I think when you're talking about containerized vegetables, you're looking at about every couple of weeks. Um, and, and that's I, usually on the package, right? Yes, good point. Thank you. I think that typically always look at your package. Look at the information they're giving you because it's good information about that particular plant. If you're buying a seedling in a nursery or a garden center, um, typically they have that little, um, oh, what am I, what am I calling it? The little yeah, like a little steak. Yeah. And it has a few uh, key important things. Needs full sun, needs partial sun, et cetera. Um, and so you get a few clues there about your type of plant. And certainly um, you could also Google up needs of this type of plant. And it's going to tell you um, how you need to work with irrigation and fertilizer. Okay. Yeah, and on the bag of fertilizer too, it'll it'll say you know how often to fertilize your your plants. Of course, they want you to use as much as yeah. possible, but um, <laughs> they're <Every> telling it. <laughs> Probably the the a master gardener website would be a better source, right? Yeah, I agree. Okay, the next question: We're re recommended to plant basil or borage near tomatoes. Would it be in separate containers near each other, or it must be planted within the same container? Well, probably the closer the better. So, um, if you could put it in the same container, that would be great. I mean, I suppose if you have containers that are really adjacent, um, it might it might work. Um, but I was kind of thinking the same container. And then okay, and this is a related question. Does basil like full sun while it's growing alongside tomatoes? Well, there again, the tomato plant is going to grow a lot taller than the basil, so it will provide some shade for the basil. Um, so um, yes, because if you were just planting basil by itself, you wouldn't need to put it, you wouldn't want to put it in really direct sun. But um, you know, if it is got gets shaded by the, another plant, then it probably would be okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Your thoughts on terracotta balls? Do you think they are effective? I don't even know what that is. I don't either. No, I don't know what that is. A terracotta Never heard of those. Ball. Um, okay, let's go to the next question. Is thyme a perennial or should it be replaced annually? Well, that's interesting. I have thyme in my container in my backyard and I'm not remembering that specifically, although I will say that this thyme has overwintered uh, twice. So therefore, and it's gotten larger. So I'm thinking it, it may be at least a semi-perennial that it lasts more than an annual, more than one season of growth. So I am, however, about to pull it out because 
on this third summer, it is now really sticky and sort of unattractive. And I'm thinking that um, it's not doing well any longer. So I'm about to pull it out. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of herbs do last more than one season. I know my oregano, my sage, they've come back. Parsley, not so much, um, but um, yeah. It Par just, parsley is a biennial, it only lasts two years. Yeah, yeah. My parsley, I got really stubborn and uh, you know, he's just been out there in the pot going gangbusters now. And, uh, but I do notice that his leaves are yellowing a little, so maybe he's getting close to giving up the ghost, but we'll see. A little fertilization and direct sun, we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, we have a last few questions here. Is 10.55 the appropriate balance for veggie fertilizer? Gosh. Well, you know what? I mean, sometimes you need different fertilizers as a season goes on. Um, I'm always a bit uh, hesitant <laughs> with the fertilizers because um, I know that um, I, the first number on the bag is nitrogen and nitrogen makes the foliage grow really well. But if you have too much nitrogen on your, um, on your plant, um, it can, um, you know, it won't produce as much fruit. Um, so at that point, you know, you need to um, kind of pull back on the nitrogen and um, go with, um, you know, something that like, I guess it's phosphate, right? Phosphate mm -hmm. um, would be something that produces the um, actual fruit. Mm -hmm. That's probably a good question for our help desk as well. They probably would be able to research that for you more thoroughly. Um, and you can go to our uh, website to look um, to ask those questions. Um, we have a little bit more information on the terracotta balls. It says they apparently absorb water and release it into the soil. And since none of the three of us have ever heard of these, I would recommend that this person go to our help desk. So go to our website and then ask our help desk to investigate those to see if they actually uh, work. I believe that's the end of our questions. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say um, the phosphorus is more for the leaves. And I, I, I wanted to correct myself. The potassium is more actually for the, the fruiting, you know, the fruit. But again, the help desk could give more detail about that. Yes. And our help desk does a very nice job. If you send them a question, they will research it and provide you with information that you can then uh, further research it yourself as well. And that's um, a great way to follow up on something that you're not sure about. And so with the end of our questions, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. You had excellent questions. Um, thank you for coming to our presentation. And please don't hesitate to go to our website to find out about the other presentations that we'll be giving on May 8th, May 12th, and May 26th. So we hope that you can attend one of those as well. Thank you so much.